show that a bribe has been given, right? You have to be there in the room when the money is given in a bag or in a box or, or a check. But journalists cannot be there. Journalists have been more successful in showing how the bribe money was spent. So they've investigated like houses being bought, uh, boats, planes being bought by high officials and using that to show that the, these officials cannot possibly afford these assets given what they earn. So they looked at the fruits of the corrupt, they investigated the fruits of the corruption rather than the actual corruption itself. And it's been a very productive way of doing investigations on corruption. They've also investigated gifts, travel, other perks given to politicians in exchange for favors. They've investigated campaign contributions, uh, um, common way in which politicians around the world um, hide bribe money is by setting up foundations or non-profits to be able to accept, you know, donations or actually bribes from wealthy individuals. And they investigate, you know, what we call the ties that bind, the connections of politicians and their relatives to contract, government contractors, lobbyists, etc. I'll show you more examples of this just to in, in the course of this, just to see how it is being done. Now, investigative reporting is changing. In the past, most of these exposés were being done by people like you and me, professional journalists who are paid full-time wage by a newspaper or a TV station. That's no longer the case. This is a classic example. This is a blogger. This is an article that came out in Foreign Policy about the First Lady of Tunisia. What the blogger did was he traced the, where the presidential plane was going. And it is well known that the Tunisian president rarely leaves the country. I don't know why, but he rarely leaves the country. But he found out that the presidential plane was going to places like Milan, Paris, and Brussels. And so he used, he's a blogger, but what he used was he used uh, <coughs> This is how to be a presidential plane spotter, actually. He used, you need to get the aircraft tail number or construction number of a plane. So a presidential plane, that's easy to get because you get a photograph and the tail number is there. And there's usually a lot of records on that. And then you find photos of that plane that are set up by plane, amateur plane spotting websites. There are people in this world whose hobby it is to take pictures of planes when they land in airports. They're called plane spotters. And these people put up those pictures, including the date, the airport, the time mm -hmm. they saw those planes, and they put it up on websites like this. And these websites are searchable. So you can search by aircraft type, you can search by tail number, you can search by, and then they check it against the official schedules to find out, you know, is there improper use of the presidential plane. And this is basically what this Tunisian blogger did. He did not say that the first lady was going around using this place to go shopping. What he said was, where is the presidential plane going? Because he couldn't find any evidence when the president is not going anywhere. Why was the presidential plane traveling, you know, France, um, Geneva, Milan, Brussels, you know, the shopping capitals of the world, and it was well known that the First Lady loved to go shopping. So it was one way. Remember, Tunisia is a very controlled country. The press there, it's, it's almost like a dictator. It's a very authoritarian regime. And there's very little that the official press can report. So what happens is you have bloggers picking up the slack in the reporting and using easily available tools that are on the internet to be able to put stories like these together. What this means is that we are facing very stiff competition from people who have a lot of time in their hands to do a lot of these researches in these sites and come out with stories that we as journalists um, have either missed because we were looking in the opposite direction, we were mainly covering press conferences, and <laughs> whereas the real stories are now being done with people who are not being paid but who are motivated, for whatever, whatever reason, the desire for truth, they have nothing better to do with their time, using sites that are put up by other people who also have nothing better to do with their time, to be able to come up with groundbreaking reporting. It should make us feel very nervous, and it does, it, because 
Um, if you want to do this, by the way, just for Pakistan and China, these are the time you can search. If you have nothing better to do, um, you, you can search the, the tail number and the construction number of the thing and see what you get on these sites. It's, it's, a nice, it's a nice test, but that's the fact. So what is happening is that we journalists no longer have the monopoly of information and news production. Increasingly, our audience is producing investigative news themselves. That is because there is so much information that is easily available on the internet. And that information is in a global repository, easily crosses borders. So it's now very easy to do the kinds of international cross-border investigations that were impossible to do in the past, especially if you're in some remote country that doesn't have your news organization doesn't have all that those resources. Now the internet is available to everyone and a lot of the information is still free. So information has been democratized. But as professional journalists, that doesn't mean there is no longer any role for professional journalists, but as professional journalists, we can tap into this democratized information um, sphere and use it, use it for the kind of reporting that we want to do. Just to show you some more examples of the stuff done both by professional and non-professional journalists. The internet is a visual medium, it's multimedia. And there's, you know, most of us do Google searches. And what we mainly look for is we look for text. But actually a lot of the evidence of the wrongdoing we want to prove can come from non-text evidence. And I have some examples here, maps, audio and video, satellite images. This is a satellite images of the swimming pool of uh, guess which country? Italy. 